Hey everybody, Chris, the old ass retro gamer here. Today I'm going to do my second episode of Dreamcasting. So if you're not already in the know, my Dreamcasting series is all about my quest to get a complete Sega Dreamcast collection. It was one of my earliest collecting goals when I got back into the hobby back in 2013. And it continues to this day and has become quite difficult lately because prices have been shooting up on certain games, making it very hard to collect for, but I have not given up. Never give up. Never surrender. And even though it has become a little harder to collect for recently, I did manage to knock a few of the heavy hitters off of my checklist, which makes me very happy. So according to this app I have on my phone called Dream Collection, there are 253 games that were released in the US for the Sega Dreamcast. In the last video, I was up to 123 games out of that 253, which leaves 130 games left to collect to get a complete set. Here we go. Sliver, which is an RPG, that is not all that hot. It's kind of like an action RPG almost, but there aren't that many RPGs available for the Dreamcast, which I always thought was kind of a sad thing, but this one didn't help matters any because there isn't a whole lot to it. You just play as this little guy running around, beating the shit out of things, getting XP. The story's kind of lame. It's just the graphics are... Not a fan. Which leads us to Evolution 2, which is one of the few RPGs available for the Dreamcast that is actually a really decent RPG. The storyline is kind of generic, just like the first one was. The character designs are kind of weird and anime-esque, kind of super deformed. Not a big fan of that, but the cool thing is that the dungeons are pre-laid out by the developers, and other times it's randomly generated, which is kind of cool. There's some decent anime-ish cutscenes, and, you know, the storyline, like I said, is pretty simple, but, you know, for an RPG of this era, it's not too bad. Seventh Cross Evolution, which is this really unique game that's all about creating life forms and helping them to evolve to be able to take on bigger creatures, and you're kind of, like, trying to populate a world, which is... Kind of a unique concept. The last time you were able to play a game that was similar to this was Evo for the Super Nintendo, and, and you know, Spore came along later on for the PC, which is all right. I have the Wii version of it, but this one, it's it's very basic. It's very simple. It's like you start off as like a single-celled organism, and then you have to collect certain icons to be able to evolve your character, and eventually you can like start choosing the kind of limbs they need to survive, and you know, can they? Can they sting things? Can they get pinchers for their arms? You know, do they are they going to start to walk on land? Or are they going to continue being sea creatures? It's not all that exciting, honestly. But I'm not complaining because this is a strange oddity for the system. Even though it's not like super awesome amaze balls, blow my mind, fun. It's different enough to keep my attention, which is pretty awesome. Worms World Party, which is yet another Worms game. Not that I'm complaining. I love the Worms series of games. They're super fun, especially if you have a group of people around that are willing to trash talk and throw grenades and shoot rockets at each other. It is super fun as a party game, but this one you can go online. Well, you could go online when the Dreamcast was able to do such a thing. But if you like Worms to begin with, you're gonna love this one. Out of the two games available for the Dreamcast from this series, I do believe this one is my favorite. Test Drive 6, which is yet another in the never-ending series of these Test Drive games. I'm not really a fan of them. They're not even making these anymore. I think they stopped after the Dreamcast. I don't remember there being any Test Drive games available for like the PS2 or anything like that, but whatevs. It's very early 2000s racing game. My favorite part of this whole game is the fact that it has a really cool licensed soundtrack. There's like Cirrus and Lunatic Calm, which are some of my favorite electronic bands from back in the early 2000s, but the coolest thing is whenever Gary Newman and Fear Factory's version of Cars comes on the radio. It is super awesome. It puts a smile on my face every time. A song being in a game being my favorite aspect of it, not a good sign. The original Power Stone, it's a really cool arena style beat em up. It's not really like a one-on-one -on -one fighting game, even though it is usually a one-on-one -on -one, unless you're playing a four-player battle, which is super amazing and kind of confusing. But it was a unique style of beat em up. It wasn't like an open world one or one that was just linear where you're moving from you know left to right. This one was like a 3D arena style one. You couldn't leave the confines of this one room. And it was really cool because there was a lot of environmental damage that you can give. It was super fun. And there's a sequel too. I already have it. I showed it off in my last video. This was one of the first games I got for my Dreamcast. I picked this up on day one. I played the hell out of it. And I still do. It is super fun. Heavy Metal Geomatrix, which is this really awesome arena style beat-em-up slash shooter. 
Uh, it's in the third person. You basically have a huge selection of characters to choose from. You get dropped into this arena with a whole bunch of NPCs or other characters because it is a four-player game, so you can be playing your friends in this also. And you have to annihilate every single thing in this arena to be able to move on to the next one. It is a lot of fun. It is really fast-paced, and it is crazy. There's crazy weapons and abilities and shit. It is just... It's nuts. The coolest thing about it to me when this game first came out was that... It's a game licensed off of Heavy Metal. That blew my mind back in the day. Heavy Metal is kind of an adult-oriented comic book. You know, it's, it borders on the pornographic at times. I remember seeing the original movie back in the early 80s. My parents took me to see that in the drive-in, which is something they probably should not have done from the amount of chesticles jumping around in that movie and the violence and the drug use, but whatevs. Um, and then we got a sequel, and there was a game made for the PC based on that sequel, which I did own for my PC, and was actually not too bad. But the fact that we got one for a console just kind of, it was it was awesome. I could not believe it, and I just had to snap it up the moment I saw it back in the day. And you know what? It still holds up. It is a lot of fun, especially as a four-player game. The graphics aren't too great. They're kind of blocky, but, you know, this is what Dreamcast did. And it has a really cool licensed soundtrack. I highly recommend this one. D2, which is a sequel, sort of to D that came out for the PlayStation, the 3DO, and the Saturn back in the 90s. Although it is a sequel in name only, this has absolutely nothing to do with D or Enemy Zero, which was like the pseudo side story game that came out for the Saturn. They all star the same character, Laura, uh, but they really don't have anything to do with each other, uh, which is really disappointing to me because I love D, even though it is a slower paced game, it was just very atmospheric and it was creepy and, and it was really fun too, even though it was just basically one long extended FMV. But outside of that, it really got under my skin. This one is a science fiction 3D adventure game that takes place like in the Canadian Rockies. And you're stranded out there with another girl and there's like an alien invasion going on. And it's not all that exciting. There's a lot of these really boring, talky cutscenes with some really shitty voice acting. Oh, this. It's um, medicine. Just medicine. Would you like some? What the fuck is that? The combat isn't all that fun, I guess. And it's just, there's not a whole lot going on. And for a game that is on, like, how many discs? Four discs? Holy shit. It's just not all that great. But if you take it as its own game and don't really try to connect anything to the original D, it's not that bad, but it's not really something that I would recommend just because it's just completely off in a completely different direction from what I expected it to be, which was disappointing, but it is what it is. Pen Pen Triisalon. Very bizarre titled game. Took me forever to figure out how to say it. It's like a triathlon with animals. It's like track and field. It's kind of cool, kind of goofy. Uh, but there's three different events you can participate in. Belly surfing, ice walking, and swimming. Some of them are better than others, I'm not gonna lie. Some are fun, some are just kind of like, is this over yet? <sighs> But you have a bunch of really cute animals to choose from. It's a different type of a game. I mean, I, I recommend it based on that alone, but it doesn't really have a whole lot of replay value because it's just, there's actually not a whole lot of content in here. It is best as a four player game. Sega Smash Pack Volume 1, which is basically just a bunch of Sega games thrown onto one disc from all different systems, from the Genesis to the Saturn. Spec Ops 2 Omega Squad, Tee Off, it's golf. Flag to flag, F1 racing type of game. Hooray. Crazy Taxi 2, more of the same if you like the first game. Qbert, which is just a upgraded version of the old arcade game. Namco Museum Volume 1, which came out for every freaking console out there, including the Game Boy Advance. San Francisco Rush 2049, NFL Blitz 2000, Maximum Pool. Gotta love that snooker. Midway's Arcade's Greatest Hits Volume 2. This one has 720, Gauntlet, Paperboy, Moon Patrol, Rampage, and Spy Hunter. Ooga Booga. Yep and the original Sega Dreamcast web browser disc. Hooray! Nightmare Creatures 2, which I picked up at Game Dude while I was visiting LA. I couldn't show this one off in the last pickups video because I wanted to save it for this episode. Um, but, yeah, Nightmare Creatures 2. It's a port of a PlayStation 1 game, and the graphics reflect that. It didn't look like they upgraded anything to what the Dreamcast could do. It looks like a straight-on port. It might look a little bit better, just a slight little bit, but it basically looks like a PS1 game, and it plays just like one, too. It's not a bad game, it's just it's really disappointing that we got a whole lot of conversions from PlayStation 1 games to Dreamcast back in the day, and most of them at least had a nice graphical upgrade, not this one. This one's just like, here you go, PlayStation 1 game, straight port, enjoy. But it does feature music by Rob Zombie, which is kind of awesome, but is on its own just like a generic 
horror themed beat em up game. Spawn in the Demon's Hand, which is if you liked Heavy Metal Geomatrix, this is basically the exact same game with a spawn coat of paint on it. Um, but the thing is, between the two, I prefer Heavy Metal to the Spawn game because this one is so fast and chaotic and it's really hard to keep track of what is going on. Uh, the graphics are nice for a Dreamcast game. There was just so much going on at one time and your view is so narrow that it's really hard to keep track of where your enemies are and you're just constantly getting hit from all angles and it's, uh, it's, just, it's really frustrating at times. But it doesn't mean it is not fun, because even as a four-player game, it is crazy and insane. So it's a companion piece to Heavy Metal Geomatrix in my eyes. The two of these go together, and you should probably play them back-to-back -back if you have a party going on. Uh, depends on what you like. You like sci-fi stuff, or you like horror stuff? Dragon Riders Chronicles of Pern, which is based off of a series of books, I believe, that are kind of Dungeons & Dragons related. It's an RPG... Bear in mind where you don't really do a whole lot of dragon riding, like the name suggests. Watch your enemy and how they move no, you don't. It is really sad and really depressing. Uh, it is extremely boring and long, and there is not a whole lot going on. It's just constant talking to people and having endless conversations about stuff that kind of doesn't have anything to do with the plot, which is not all that great to begin with, but it is just... For a game called Dragon Riders, I wanted to ride some dragons. Was that too much to ask? Apparently it was. Uh, and when you do, it is kind of... Really disappointing. Fur Fighters, which is a 3D shooter beat-em-up action game. It's okay, I guess. It was also available, I think, for the PS2? The play mechanics are kind of wonky, and I it's just... It's not all that fun, to be honest. I mean... You would think that something goofy like this would be kind of a follow-up to, like, Conker's Bad Fur Day. It was just really goofy with foul-mouthed animals and stuff running around shooting each other, and you would expect it to be like that, and it's not. It's just a generic, like, 3D action game. Best part about it is this lenticular cover. Yay! And then there's Spirit of Speed 1937. Oh my... This is one of the worst games I've ever played. You would think that a racing game set in the late 1930s would actually be kind of fun. It is a unique concept. Everything has to do with, you know, NASCAR and arcade type stuff. Well, no. What if you were racing around with, like, these underpowered cars? It would be kind of a refreshing change of pace, but no. This is the last game that LJN released. Acclaim kind of realized that they had a stinker on their hands, and they just kind of slapped the LJN logo on it. I think they wanted to distance themselves from it because it is a real piece of crap. Graphics, garbage. Play control, no. Game design, where? Everything about this game is broken. It is not fun to play. The controls are just wonky. Like, you touch the edge of the track, a smidge a, by a hair and your car will flip around and you've basically lost the match at that point hate it hate it hate it hate it ljn defender slash cygnus destroyer reviewed this not too long ago and he even said yeah i like me some ljn games even ones that people consider to be absolute trash there's nothing redeeming about this game Ned, skip it Street Fighter 3 Double Impact and Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. I never really played the Street Fighter 3 games in the arcade. At the time these games were available in cabinet form was a time where I really wasn't going to the arcade all that often. And if I did, I did not see them. They did not have them anywhere. Um, so when they came to the home consoles, I was kind of like, all right, now I can actually try these things out. And you know what? I still like Street Fighter 2 a lot more. Uh, but these games have some unique characters. The animation is fantastic. The, the moveset for your favorite characters is still there uh, for the characters that did come back. Um, but I like the new characters that they added in and some of the new mechanics. It's like Capcom was trying way too hard to go like Street Fighter 2 Extreme with these. Because, honestly, these could have still been Street Fighter 2 continuations, the way they're set up. But the animation is awesome. It is fun, don't get me wrong. It is a lot of fun. I mean, it is Street Fighter after all, but I really prefer Street Fighter 2 to these. Typing of the Dead. Yes, somebody thought that taking House of the Dead and combining it with typing was a good idea. So instead of shooting zombies in the games like you normally would, you now have to type out words really fast in order to cause damage and defeat them as they try to attack you. How are you supposed to do that with a controller? You could get the Sega Dreamcast keyboard, which I did. Actually, I got these two within a week of each other, which was planned. Because you need this 
to play this. Magic. And is it fun to destroy zombies with your typing skills? Yes, it is. You would not think that by taking a game that is about horror themes and mixing it with like an education type game at the same time would combine very well. And it does. It is a lot of fun. It almost gave me carpal tunnel trying to type out some of these damn words, but worth it because this game is entertaining to the max. The Last Blade 2, Heart of the Samurai. Picked this one up while I was in LA at that Game Dude store I was talking about. I'll probably never be able to afford a Neo Geo or any Neo Geo game. Yeah, sad now. Getting ports of those games for that expensive ass console on other consoles is awesome, which is why I've been really looking forward to picking up a copy of Last Blade 2. It's another one-on-one -on -one fighting game like most of the games that SNK ends up cranking out for their consoles. Not that I'm complaining because they're really fun. This one is no different, but it kind of makes me think it's a spinoff of Samurai Showdown because it has the same kind of feel to it, which I love. Great graphics, great animations, the move sets are great. It's, it's just a hell of a lot of fun. I really, really like Last Blade 2. And Ill Bleed is another game I picked up at Game Dude in LA. Being a really big fan of B-movies is why I tended to gravitate toward wanting this game so badly. Because this is essentially an interactive B-movie. Uh, you play as a character who goes to a haunted amusement park and there's different attractions that you can go to and each one takes a little over an hour to complete, maybe more. And each one is crafted after a B-movie cliche environment. And that's kind of awesome. There's like a haunted shopping center. There's geysers of blood everywhere. The controls are a little wacky because it's trying to be like Resident Evil and it's not exactly pulling it off properly. And there's lots of really, really shitty dialogue. But it is fun. The problem is the game doesn't know if it wants to be goofy or serious like Resident Evil. Does it want to be this campy B-movie thing or does it want to be scary? It is not really that scary, and at times it is not really all that funny. It would have been kind of nice if the developers just decided to like stick to one theme and run with it the whole way through. But it's not bad. It's not great either, but it's pretty good. It's a little expensive nowadays, so keep that in mind. So now let's get into the games that are harder to find, harder to come across because of price, and some that are unique in other ways. Yes. Let's go with the unique ones first, like Feet of Fury. This is a homebrew unlicensed game by Cryptic Illusion, and it is a clone of Dance Dance Revolution. But since there was no pad controller ever developed for the Dreamcast, they made you have to play this game with a controller. Which is not bad. I mean, it controls perfectly fine. I mean, the DDR games could be played with controllers instead of the pad also on all the other consoles, so it, it works here too. But the thing that would make or break this game is if the music was terrible. And although I don't know of any of the bands that this game is claiming to have license to, the music is not bad. Some of the tracks are better than others, but that's not really saying much. I mean, it is like techno-y dance tracks. Some are faster, some are slower paced, whatever. But the cool thing about this game is, and it says here right on the back, when you tire of the built-in song selection, download a swap CD from the internet with new songs and steps. So basically there's DLC available for this game. I'm assuming you have to burn it onto a CDR or some sort to play because the Dreamcast actually will play burned games. But I haven't tried it yet, but maybe I'll do a full review on it after I do. It's a really fun game. It's not great, but it's not bad. It's just... It's, it is what it is. Pure Solar and the Great Architects, which I talked about in my favorite games of 2015 video. This was number 10 on my list. Why? Because it's a pretty good RPG and it's fun. But better yet, it's a new RPG for the Dreamcast. Dreamcast games still coming out in 2015. Pure Solar started off around 2010 as a Genesis homebrew from watermelon games and it became so popular that it became like back ordered for years there was like a kickstarter to get materials so that they can actually fulfill the orders and all that and then like out of nowhere last year maybe the year before watermelon announced that they were going to be releasing hd versions of the game on all these other platforms like the ps4 and i think the xbox one and pc and the dreamcast because yes a new rpg for the dreamcast mine so you bet your ass I jumped on it when I found out about it. I didn't get any of the limited edition versions that come in these massive boxes with all these other trinkets and whatnot. No, I just wanted the game. Uh, and it came in this nice little clamshell. But the game, as I said in my favorite games of 2015 video, it does have a high learning curve. And there is a long stretch where nothing really of note happens. 
and sometimes the story just kind of goes nowhere. But once you really get into it, it takes off and it is super, super fun. I love the combat system in this game. It is very unique. And the graphics are great, and the game allows you to switch between the original Genesis graphics and these new upgraded Dreamcast graphics. Really cool. Um, I highly recommend you pick up a copy if you can still find one. And now on to the games that took me quite a while to add to my collection because they are of a higher price point and they're not easy to come by. So when I got that bonus that I was talking about from work at the beginning of 2016, I said, yes, you're going to do this. These games will be yours. It is a twofer. Yes, it is a, a double pack, sort of. It is a, it is a series of two. I don't know how many other ways I can say it. Giga Wing and Giga Wing 2. Capcom bullet hail shooters. They seem to release a lot of these for the Dreamcast. Not that I'm complaining because every other one that they've released is awesome. And these are no different. These are supremely cool bullet hail shoot 'em ups that are hard as hell, as expected. Great graphics, great music. The control is amazing. Oh my god, it will make you want to rip your hair out sometimes, it is so difficult. But holy cow, these games are so sought after, and they are honestly worth every penny because they are so much fun. I actually got these two in a bundle together, which was great. But if I were to choose between one of these as my favorite, don't get me wrong, they're both awesome, but I would probably have to pick Giga Wing 2. It's a little more polished, it's a little more fun, and I think it's a little bit more forgiving, but... They're both amazing games. I'm so happy these are in my collection now. And my last game is quite a doozy. It is one of the most expensive games available for the Dreamcast. It is one of the ones that has been the hardest to track down a copy of in my entire time collecting for the Dreamcast. And when I got that bonus from work at uh, the beginning of 2016, headed over to that retro game store that I go to that's almost downtown in Chicago called People Play Games. And lo and behold, they had a copy of it sitting right there smacking me in my face going, Hey, look, I'm here taking it home. So I said, I will do that. Cannon Spike by Capcom. This is one of my holy grail games. I do believe it was the last game released for the Dreamcast after it was canceled because I recall when the announcement came out that Sega was putting the kibosh on the system, I remember this game came out like a couple of days later and I almost bought it at one point, but I was like, eh, I don't know much about it. But I was thinking about selling my Dreamcast off at that point, too. And I never ended up doing that because I still have my original Dreamcast that I bought way back in 99. But I wish I did buy it back in the day because now it is worth a mint. So it is a top-down action game. It reminds me of Super Smash TV a little bit, uh, just the way the game plays. You play as nothing but, like, Capcom characters. I do believe this is Charlie from the Street Fighter games. And you can end up playing as Cammy from Street Fighter or Mega Man, which is amazing. Crazy weapons, crazy shit going on. Basically, you're like part of this robot destroying police force and you go around blowing up anything that's mechanized, which is awesome. Kill all the robots. Do it, do it, do it. Sorry, Robocop. I like it! It is super fast, it is fun. Crazy awesome graphics, the controls are spot on. Everything about it is like near perfection. Awesome game, hard to find, worth every penny. And that is it. Wow. I, as you can tell, I really, really put a lot of effort into getting as many Dreamcast games checked off the list as I possibly could in a short period of time because my goal was to have my entire collection complete by like the first quarter of 2016, but that hasn't happened because a lot of these games have jumped up in price. But what is the tally now? Well, out of the 253 games available for the Dreamcast, I had 130 left to find, managed to get 35 new games, not counting the two unlicensed games. That leaves me with 95 games left to collect for my complete set, which is good, but there's still quite a lot of expensive games out there and a lot of the cheaper ones which are hard to find in good condition. So I still have my work cut out for me. It might take until the end of the year. That's okay. I deal with it. I roll with the punches. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. Give the video a thumbs up if you like what you see. Share the video on the social media and leave any and all comments below. I read each and every one of them and answer all of them if possible. What is your favorite Dreamcast game? What system are you trying to get a complete set for? Which of these games is like your, oh my god, he found that moment. So until next time, I am Chris the Old Ass Retro Gamer signing off. Blah, blah, blah.